Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. Uh, some of you have been waiting for a while for us to get started, so thanks for being patient with us. Uh, but uh, now we're ready to go, and I think we're going to probably go, rather than 90 minutes or two hours, we'll probably go maybe an hour and 15 minutes or so, so it doesn't end up being too late back east for uh, Renee and, and uh, uh, Brother Cripps. Uh, and we're going to also require some time to do a, the introduction tonight of this chapter. It deserves its own introduction. So before we get started, let me ask uh, Renee to, if there's anybody watching who doesn't know Sister Renee, Renee, just tell them who you are and what you're doing on YouTube, please. Hey guys, Renee Roland, channel of the same name. I contend for the faith once delivered into the saints, the free gift of eternal life given to us by trust in the finished work of Christ. The gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, Christ died for our sins according to scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again on the third day. And when we trust in that, he gives us eternal life because he did all the work. Uh, I also untwist twisted scriptures on my channel. Uh, my, our guest pastor tonight, we're late because of me. We had a guest pastor, ran a little bit late, later than normal. I appreciate them waiting for me. It was very gracious. Um but one of the things he said is that the Bible can be dangerous for an unsaved person. They can twist it. That's where you get these cults. That's where you get all this stuff because the Holy Spirit is not teaching them all truth. Okay, guys, I look forward to this study with you. Line by line, precept by precept tonight. Right, Brother Luke and Jason? All right, God bless. Amen. And uh, I, I will say amen to uh, Renee's uh, description of her channel, uh, she does better than anybody I know, anybody I've ever seen. Uh, untwist the twisted scriptures, as she said. That's a great way of, of pointing it out. The scriptures that the Lordship heretic use against the, the free gift of salvation, uh, she's able to teach you the proper understanding of those verses. So if you or anybody else is having trouble in that area, that's where you need to go. Renee Roland. Uh, now, Brother Cripps, tell them what you're doing on YouTube. Yep. First of all, I will say amen as well to what uh, Renee said. Very, very crucial uh, ministry, and it has been something that has helped strengthen uh, areas where uh, I might have had some things that I wasn't even aware of that might have been twisted uh, just because of all the interpretations that I grew up with, and it's it's been enlightening. Um, I'm Jason Cripps, and I have uh, part of a channel called True Story Live, which comes on Sunday nights at 9. And uh, we just invite everyone to come to the table and have discussions. And most of the people on the panel are believers, and we have one uh, uh, person that calls himself uh, an atheist. But uh, the more and more I get to know him, the more and more I think that uh, he's, he's on the edge of seeing this stuff all clearly. Uh, but basically, he comes up with questions to ask a Christian panel, and we all discuss it. And uh, we, we definitely invite people to come and listen to the show. But for tonight, I love coming uh, to this uh, Bible study on Wednesdays. It's helped me tremendously. Uh, you know, we're, we're here to, to uh, study his word and look at it and have discussions of it here as well. But it helps me in my everyday life. Uh, it's amazing. The more we dive into scripture and the more we look at it line by line, precept by precept, uh, the more beneficial it is to us. Uh, and we hope it's beneficial to you. Thanks a lot, Brother Luke. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, uh, first, let me address the, the moderators in the chat room. Uh, uh, tonight, more so than ever before, uh, I'm going to ask you moderators to try to direct the conversations in the chat room to the subject we're discussing tonight. I know it's often in the chat rooms, people get involved in all kinds of other conversations and normally that's perfectly okay. But the, the, this particular chapter is uh, so important that uh, I'd like everybody to remain focused on it. And moderators, if you do find someone in there that's trying to stir up trouble and change the subject or uh, uh, trolls, uh, please nip that in the bud. Uh, let's so that we can all stay focused on this study tonight. Now, we're beginning Romans chapter nine tonight. Uh, it, it, we, we, of course, we started uh, working with 
uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 1, and finally we've reached this point. So if you have not seen all the previous studies on the book of Romans, I urge you to go watch it all from the beginning. But now that we're at chapter 9, this is something I've been anticipating for a long, long time. And uh, so uh, this chapter, we, we gave an, the first study we did on the book of Romans, the first night, uh, much of the time was giving you an introduction to the book, uh, laying a foundation. Uh, kind of giving you a lens to, to look through as you study the book. And it may seem strange, but this chapter uh, really needs its own introduction also. So uh, bear with me as I make a few points here, and then we'll get into the verses. But uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to read. I've done a lot of study preparing for this, uh, teaching this chapter. Uh, a lot of notes I've taken, a lot of preparation. Normally, I kind of fly by the seat of my pants. I, all of us are kind of extemporaneous the way we do these things. But tonight, uh, it's a little bit different uh, because of the importance. So uh, let me read this. What I wrote, it says, The problem with Calvinism begins with their misunderstanding of Romans chapter 9. Because they get this wrong, they are forced to then redefine many words in all the other scriptures that clearly debunk Calvinism and TULIP, such as some of the words that they have to redefine are all, world, whosoever, and many others. You might wonder, why do they have to redefine these words? Is is because they've uh, erred in this foundational problem, Romans chapter 9. So uh, let's look, what is the, the... purpose of this chapter. Uh, Chapters 9 through 11 show Jews' place under Gentile gospel and to provoke Jews to emulation. The Gentile appropriation of salvation and reason for the transition. The transition is Jew to Gentile, uh, national to individual. Judaism to the gospel, which is faith alone in Christ alone. Chapter 9 is not about salvation, but about God's use of Israel and God's sovereign right to choose individuals and nations for his purposes, such as Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, to bring the Messiah to the nation of Israel. It is used as the center post of Calvinistic determinism. However, God uses man's free will to determine who will be saved. Matthew 23, 37. Think about this verse. This is, you learn so much from the single verse about free will. O Jerusalem, these are the words of Jesus. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. So we'll get into the verses, but the reason this is important to to get this, a a premise in our mind before we go, we, we, we go on. Calvinists, if you're not familiar with it, they consider themselves to be the intellectuals of Christianity. And they, they basically, Calvinism is a philosophy, an evil philosophy. But a Calvinist takes the Calvinist viewpoint and reads it into chapter 9. If you did not understand Calvinist philosophy and read Romans chapter 9, you might not come to that conclusion of Calvinism. But what you need to understand is what I just said. As you read chapter 9, you need to read it with these thoughts in mind. It's not about personal salvation. It's about God's uh, sovereignty to use individuals and the nation of Israel, God's right to choose them to use for a particular purpose. So you have to keep that premise in your mind as we go forward. Okay? Before I read any of the, the first verse, though, uh, Renee, uh, just give me your feedback on that so far. 
or I couldn't get my thing on a little slow with my mouse sometimes. Uh, this chapter also kills replacement theology. Uh, it, there is no Jew or Gentile, just one new man in Christ in the church, but there's still the nation of Israel. Right here, Paul is saying that the nation of Israel is being dealt with. They're temporarily blinded. We don't hate them. We didn't replace them. The church does not replace the nation of Israel. And people say, well, oh, we're spiritual Israel. Well, in a sense, we are. We're the spiritual children of Abraham by faith. But it doesn't replace the nation. And I get called a Zionist and all these horrible names. And, oh, you support those fake Jews that live in the land of Israel. They're not the real. It's horrific what I get whenever I do anything that tells people, hey, we don't replace Israel. God isn't even done with the nation of Israel, the descendants, uh, physical descendants up by the flesh. Uh, and God knows who they are, whether they're fake or not. That's not our business. God knows that. And there is a literal nation. And that nation was crazy. Shall a nation be born in a day? You know, and in a sense, it really was. It was a miracle that it Israel came back. The nation, the people are going back to the land. So, this chapter is so important to me to understand that a lot of these verses people twist are not to the church at all. They are prophetic and they are to the nation of Israel. Like all the nations come against the nation of Israel. That's not us. We don't replace them. They're not coming against us in the land at the Valley of Har Megiddo. You know, so it's so important to me, besides the Calvinism, which my goodness, Luke, I'm so glad you used that verse because I've used it so many times to show people, but you would not. And also Corazine and Bethsaida, he came there, did all the miracles, but they would not believe. And so their, their uh, judgment shall be worse than Sodom and Gomorrah because they would not. We do have free will. And I've had somebody constantly hounding me lately, telling me we're prideful because we think we chose to believe and I, I just know I'm a filthy sinner and I got to have salvation through God's grace. I'm aware of how much I fail every day and he offers salvation through Jesus. And I just received it. I don't know how that's prideful, but uh, I don't think the Calvinist might say, you know, oh, it's unconditional election. But every single one of them thinks they're one of the elect. Calvinists won't say, hey, I'm not one of the elect. You won't find a Calvinist that says, I'm not one of them. So they secretly have some pride, thinking there's something special in them that God chose to believe. And a lot of the Puritans died in agony, afraid, because they were Calvinistic. And they were like, did, did I persevere to the end? Did I do enough? And again, there's verses to Israel about enduring and it has nothing to do with the church. So this chapter is so important to me and to many. It's a very important chapter, but to me personally, to be able to show people God's uh, prophetic plan. So it's amazing. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks. Uh, your initial uh, uh, thoughts on, on my opening statement, Brother Cripps? Yeah, I, I, I'll I'll keep it short, but I just want to say how uh, delighted I am that you're uh, deciding to tackle this in the way that you are. Um, I grew up around these people, uh, Calvinists, and and I was lucky because the the particular church that I grew up in, uh, they weren't uh, they weren't as aggressive. I guess uh, they would share their ideas and share their scriptures with me, but. Um, they were less arrogant in some ways than some of the people I'm seeing nowadays, you know, some 30 odd years later. Uh, and I run into these people and you wouldn't believe the arrogance just comes from them. Um, uh, Renee mentioned pride. It's definitely pride and arrogance. And it, the, the gospel message is so simple. And what happens is men are the ones that twist it, twist it up and make it into something that's not. Um, so again, trying to keep it short, um, uh, I am uh, so glad to be part of this particular study, and I think it's going to be enlightening to everyone. Okay.
trying to paste things into the chat room over there, so some of these things, but I, uh, for some reason, when you try to paste things, it doesn't accept it for some reason. Maybe it's too much at one time. I've tried to do it, but I'll try to paste a little bit more as we go along here. Um, okay. Um, so, let's go. Uh, Romans chapter 9, verse 1. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to pause there, but to ask a question and then read verse 3. So, have you ever stopped to wonder what Paul says he has this great sorrow in his heart? Why does Paul have sorrow in his heart? Okay, verse 3. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Of course, my brethren in this case refers to the Jews, not, not Christians. They're brethren in the sense of fellow Jews. Okay, so verse uh, one through three, uh, Renee. Hold on, I'm a little slow again. <laughs> yeah, uh, he has got a burden. Uh, Paul has a burden on his heart for his own uh, brethren by the flesh, uh, the nation of Israel. As he says, you know, he's of the tribe of Benjamin and he has a heart for them. And he uh, himself was blinded thinking he was doing God a favor by persecuting and even standing by and killing and imprisoning those that believed in Jesus. But now that his eyes have been opened, he has a heaviness for them because he understands salvation is in no other. So he says, I say the truth in Christ. I lie not my conscience also bearing witness in the Holy Ghost that I have a great heaviness and continual sorrow in his heart. Why? This is talking about a group, the nation of Israel here. He loves these people. For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. He's saying that just like Moses said the same thing, hey, we'll take my name out of the book of life, but for Israel's sake, he's saying the same thing. I would accept a curse on me personally if it would save my brethren, the people I love, the nation I love, God's people, uh, Israel. Mm -hmm. Hey, Brother Cripps. Yeah, so I often uh, uh, think about how Paul felt with, with all these things that he has these concerns with and the reason why he keeps pounding on things again and again. Um, so this one's starting out, and I don't remember any other verses or any other chapter starting out quite exactly like this one. So this is this is really bothering him, and he's just making that clear. I say the truth in Christ. I, you know, he's. It, it's how we would talk to someone that we're really trying to uh, convince uh, where our feelings are coming from. So th these are pretty strong words. Um, in my conscience, bearing me witness in the Holy Holy Ghost. So this he's just confirming that he's he's prayed a lot about this. He's talked to the Holy Spirit. He's talked to God about this, and he's presenting his point. Um, and then uh, verse two, he's just describing the nature of his heart, you know, um, heaviness and continual sorrow. Uh, so this is an ongoing thing that he's dealing with when he's looking at his, at, at his uh, Jewish brothers and, and sisters. Um, and then uh, verse three, four, I could wish that myself, this is huge. I mean, taking uh, not responsibility necessarily because he doesn't have to do this, but saying that he wished that he could be cursed, accursed, and separated from Christ for the sake of everyone else. Uh, of course, he knows that that that's not the way it works. So he's going to try in these verses uh, to convince them, and and also for those of us that don't have the same understanding to convince us. Um, yeah, so I'll leave it there. Not much to, not much else to go into so far. Yeah. Well, I think that uh, everybody who's read this in the, uh, previously, it, we've probably all been um, shaken by that statement that Paul says that uh, he would read it. 
For I, I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to flesh. My kinsmen according to flesh is his fellow Jewish people. He says, I wish I was cursed and that my brethren, the Jewish people, were saved, is the point he's making there. Now that is monumental. I wonder how many of us, if any, would ever say, I'm talking about sincerely say and believe, it's heartfelt, that you would give up your own salvation if it would result in other another group of people receiving it. That's how I have always understood those verses, and, and that I believe that's the correct way of saying it. That's the point that that Paul is making there. That should shake us all. Why? Wow, what compassion Paul has. Would any of us be willing to sacrifice our own sacrifice or the salvation for any other people? Maybe if you maybe you have a child or a, you know a, a, a loved one, but a, a group of people, especially a broad group of people that you don't necessarily even know them all, but you'd be willing to do that. That is an amazing statement to make. But the real uh, profound thing that we need to understand is coming up in verse six. So let me. Let me read on uh, verse 4, 5, and 6. My kinsmen according to flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom are cons as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all. God blessed forever. Amen. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect. For they not all Israel, which are of Israel. But let me emphasize this first half of verse 6. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect. Okay. I, uh, I think that mo most people are missing a very profound thing. And yet, you know how uh, I have a lot of videos and playlists talking about church history. And I, I like to talk about the beginnings of the church, the mindset. You know, originally it was only Jewish and then Gentiles came in. Originally it was Jew practiced Judaism and believe in Jesus. And then eventually they had to leave Judaism behind. And it's only faith alone in Christ alone. Uh, and understanding the history of this transitional period of the church is important. But here's a historical thing that most people never learn. And that is that uh, oh, well, let me, read, let me read part of this in the Amplified too because it, it drives home something that is um, um, needs to be emphasized. Okay? Uh, verse 4, uh, my, my kids, natural kinsmen, who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption of sons, the glory, the special covenants with Abraham, Moses, and David, the giving of the law, the system of temple worship, and the original promises. So he's listing here all the profound things that came from this nation of Israel and these uh, uh, fathers of Judaism, Abraham, Moses, David, and all these profound things he's saying, these are because of Israel, these are because of Judaism. And so to them belong the patriarchs, and from them, according to his natural descent, came the Christ. The Christ came from these people. And yet, however, it is not as though God's word has failed, coming to nothing. Why is Paul saying, insinuating, that the gospel has been a failure? I'll tell you why. Only a tiny little fraction of all Israel believed in Jesus. 
as we know eventually the, the jewish uh, part of the church fizzled out to almost nothing almost all believers today are gentiles and so now you have this faith that's a gentile faith it's open to all but it's primarily gentiles no jews and so paul is addressing this problem the problem that was asked why should we be Jews believe in Jesus. None of us do. Look around. Hardly any Jewish people would believe he's the Messiah. So the point is, has the gospel become not effective? If the gospel is really doing its thing, why are all the Jewish people embracing it? After all, they've got the they've got all the, the fathers of the faith, they've got the temple. They even got the, this bloodline, the Messiah. They got all that, and yet hardly any of them are believing. That's why this verse here is so important. Verse 6, not as though the word of God had taken none effect. Have you ever thought why Paul would answer this question? Like, like hey, no, it, it failed. The gospel failed because no Jews, hardly any Jews believe. And he's saying, it's not as though it's been a failure. Okay? So let me get Renee first. Go ahead and give me your thoughts on those verses and, and what I just said. Yeah, I, wa I want to address something right now. One prayer is calling them vipers and all these things. There's a lot of pastors preaching hate against the Jewish people, preaching hate against Israel. And they need to read Romans 9 to understand they're not Satan's people. They are blinded temporarily. They're still God's people. They are just blinded and salvation. It says, so all of Israel be saved. God's got a plan for them and we should pray for them. We're told that. So I'm just saying, let's not get into calling them names and call it, saying they're of Satan and, and all of that. We need to read Romans 9 and see Paul's heart. See Paul's heart for these people. And Paul's heart is motivated by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit in us should motivate us to love them and pray for them as Paul did. So any pastor spewing hate uh, is not of God. And Jay, I'm sorry if you feel I hurt your feelings and you, and uh, you've judged me and there's no coming out of that. And it makes me sad. You can't learn. You said you already went to seminary, you know, everything you, you can't learn from us. So you came here just to check out our behavior. And that makes me sad. Uh, I've taken responsibility. I'm very sorry if your feelings were hurt last time. I'm a passionate person. Uh, I, I, I do apologize for hurting your feelings. So uh, Romans 9 here, it says, uh, Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants? Does it sound like they're, they're Satan's people? No. And the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, they, they have the laws to keep. They kept, you know, in Romans, it says they have the testimony of Jesus and keep the commandments. That means that's the Israel. They were given the commandments to keep. Doesn't mean that, that as people falsely teach that you're saved by works because they keep the commandments like they're saved by keeping the commandments. That's not what it means. It means those people were the Israelites. They kept the commandments, the oracles of God and they had the testimony of Jesus. And that's who they're talking about in the book of Revelation there. Uh, who are the fathers and of whom is concerning the flesh, Christ came. So he was born through them, through that nation as pertaining to the flesh, because we know Jesus pre-existed and then came in the form of flesh, in the form of sinful flesh, but had no sin, who is overall, God bless forever, amen. Not as though the word of God has taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. So what he's saying is we are kind of a spiritual Israel and they're not all Israel, which are of Israel. He's saying some of Israel has not been saved yet. They have not believed neither because they are the seed of Abraham. Are they all children? So he's saying just because they're born in the flesh after the line of Abraham doesn't mean they're his children because those that are of the faith, the same are the children of Abraham. So we're all children of Abraham, Jew or Gentile, not because they're born in the flesh, in the carnal after Abraham, but because we have believed. And some of them are children of Abraham because some of Israel has believed. And that's that's what that's saying, I believe. 
Okay. Uh, Brother Cripps, could you tell me if, uh, if you, are you getting this same thing and now that I'm bringing this to everybody's attention? In verse 6, when Paul says, not as though the word of God had taken none effect. Uh, it's, I think what Paul is doing here is saying, well, you could, you could say, you could argue that God made a mistake choosing Israel. Did God make a mistake to choose Israel? I mean, after all, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Jesse, Jesus, all came from Israel. The, 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 the scriptures all came from Israel. And yet, the Jews don't believe. This many Jews believe out of the nation. Did God make a mistake choosing Israel? I mean, all, they don't even, they, they rejected him. That, that is, I think, what Paul is, is addressing, that, that sentiment. Um, Brother Cripps? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I was trying to think of an adequate analogy to put this in modern day terms. And I just couldn't, I, I couldn't grasp it anything that carries the weight of what I feel like Paul is saying here. So just to put it in a nutshell, you have the maker of all things. You have God choosing a group of people to believe in, in him and to reconcile with him. These are the chosen ones, the chosen people. And after he, he brought them out of slavery and into the desert and to the promised land, after all the things that they saw with their own eyes that no other people saw and the the power that god used in saving them again and again and winning battles for them and then as you said brother luke you know jesse and david and and the whole line of people that that fulfilled prophecy so that they could look at the word and see the savior when he came and then so after all that jesus comes in the flesh to do exactly what uh, God said he would do from the time Adam and Eve left the garden. This is this has been a plan that he's had in place this whole time. And then, so he gets there. Jesus is here. He's come to do exactly what he, what he was told by the Father to do. And they don't see it. And not only do they not see it, but they put him on the cross. So your question is, did God make a mistake? Did God make a mistake? No. He didn't make a mistake because it's not over yet. I can tell you what I've learned from my life thus far. Uh, I I heard all the scriptures about you know waiting on on God and being patient and um, be not weary and well doing for in due time you will reap a great reward. I went a long time and I didn't see it. I didn't see a great reward. All I saw was struggle and I saw breakups and my parents getting divorced and. Jim and Tammy Baker, you know, ruining people's lives and uh, ministers falling left and right. I, I saw a, a world in disarray. And recently, after all the things that I've been through, God's, I'm, I'm in a season right now where I'm starting to see all the seeds that had been planted a long time ago start to flourish. You have to understand with, with the Israelites, with God's chosen people, uh, if they think that God's failed, they're jumping the gun because the story's not over yet. You're judging a story that you're seeing three quarters of the way through. We are going to see every promise made in, in his word. We're going to all see it come true, whether we believed in them or not. So when the Bible says, when prophecy says that, that God's not done, the story is not, is not finished, we have to trust in that and believe in that. So my answer to the question uh, did did God make a mistake? Absolutely not. In fact, he it, it, we're falling right into his plan. His plan will take place regardless of what happens and how it looks. Uh, there was a there was a sermon I forget who it was by, but um, it's the idea of talking about uh, the crucifixion and the resurrection, and the the term was it's Friday but Sunday's coming. It's Friday, but Sunday's come, and he kept pounding that again and again. And that's the situation with the Jews. It may seem all is lost. 
but the bottom line here, as far as Paul's concerned, is he's he's feeling the heaviness of all of this that I just described in his heart of seeing that uh, God chose these people and they turned they turned away and not only turned away from God and didn't see the Messiah for who he was, but they crucified him. Now, the, did God did that fit into God's plan? Absolutely, it did. God's going to make everything happen that he promises to happen. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to repeat this over and over again because I need everybody, if, whether you're in the chat room now or watching this five years from now, I need everybody to have this thought in their mind as they go continue on. Because as we continue on, these verses are going to be twisted by Calvinists to make God evil. That's what Calvinism does, it makes God evil. I made a video talking about this study tonight, five minutes long, warning, Calvinism will be destroyed. And why do I hate Calvinism so much? Because Calvinism makes God evil. Man is an innocent puppet. God is the evil one forcing us to sin. So if you don't get this right, when you come to these next few verses that we're going to be going through, you, can, you don't want to put Calvinism in. As I Jesus, reading Calvinism into it. So that's why you need to get this in your mind. Chapter 9 is not about personal salvation but about God's use of Israel and God's sovereign right to choose individuals and nations for his purposes. Now, and the next few verses will illustrate how he does this, okay? Verse 7. Uh, let me see how far I want to go first here. Let's see. Oh. Okay. Okay. Uh, Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy, side, shall thy seed be called. Sovereign act of God deciding Isaac would be the one. God has the sovereign right to choose, elect individuals to serve his purpose. He didn't choose Isaac to get saved. He chose Isaac for a purpose, for the seed, the genealogy line. Verse 8, that is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. God in his sovereignty, decided that he was going to use Sarah. That's election. Not electing Sarah for salvation, not electing, uh, you know, uh, Tom, Dick, and Harry for salvation. But God has a right as God to choose to use particular individuals. This is what we would call election, electing them to serve, to work in a particular purpose in God's plan. And Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebecca also has had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, not based upon what, uh, you know, um, uh, Isaac or uh, 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 Esau did nothing to do with merit on their part, but because of God's uh, sovereign right to choose who he's going to use for this genealogy. But, uh, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. God will decide. And it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. It's a decree by God, but he's not saying the elder will be saved, the younger won't. It's not about personal salvation. Okay, so that gets us through verse 12, and that's why I keep on emphasizing this. I have to keep on emphasizing it 
if you think this chapter is talking about personal salvation, you're going to fall into the Calvinistic trap thinking that God decides who gets saved and who doesn't get saved. And we have no free will, nothing to say about it. Okay? Uh, Renee? Renee? I was trying to let everybody uh, uh, know. Can Jason go first? I was trying yeah. to remind everybody to stick to the topic. I want to clean up in there. Yeah, all right, thanks. Jason? Yeah, sure, no problem. So to me, when I when I read these verses, all he's doing is setting up setting up the situation for how God chose to make all this happen. It, it, it's not deeper than that. Um, I guess if you throw the, the English word for election in there, that's what gets people all, all crazy. It just simply means that that's the way that God decided it was going to happen. I don't, I don't see why anyone should have a, any issue with that and make it any more than it is. It, it, it's, it's just the way God chose for it to happen. Uh, in his uh, understanding of things from beginning to end, this is the way that he planned to do it, and it's nothing more than that. And uh, Brother Luke, I just wanted to be encouraging here. As many times as you have to say it again and again and again, it's worth it so that people can can see that uh, Calvinism is uh, wrong. It's way off base. So that's the purpose. Thanks. Yes. Okay. Hey, Luke, is it, too, is it too soon for me to even mention what I think about the Esau thing? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Okay. Okay. Uh, it'd be hard. It's hard to do it to say it. I'm just. I, I I have I have Old Testament verses we're going to be going to next to, to Okay, uh, good. Let's. To, let, to I'll wait. In context, but in, anything regarding the last thing I said and and uh, Brother Cripps's uh, comment. Anything you want to add to that? Uh, no, because I kind of want to do it all at at, at one time because it won't make sense yeah. that I'm scared to go a little too far. Okay. All right. So now. The next verse, let me see. I got a lot of pages open and it's hard to, for me to uh, maneuver to pull up the right one here. Let me see. Okay. Oh, there it is. Okay. All right. Verse 12 says, It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. So this is God exercising his sovereignty, his right as God and ruler, that he has the right and he exercises it. He chooses how he's going to have all this play out to bring the Savior into the world, okay? And so one of the things he decides is the elder will serve the younger. That contradicts the tradition. The, the firstborn is always... Uh, the one, the main one, and the younger serve the, the, the other. So God's flipping it around here. He's making his sovereign decision to do that. Now, now we need to go to Genesis 12, because we're going to be going to the Old Testament to find out what these things are about. And also, uh, uh, because you don't have the context to know, uh, to know uh, what he, Paul is quoting and referencing Old Testament events. Okay, so now let's go to Genesis 12. And uh, this is the purpose of election and or the, the calling of Abraham and his descendants. Verse 12, uh, I mean, uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Maybe I should post this. Uh, let me see if I can post it here for everybody. 1 through 3. Uh, this is chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Let me try to get up there. It'd be helpful if everybody could read along with me. Did it let me? No, it didn't let me. Let me put in the chat, in our private chat then. At least Renee and Crypt can see it. Okay, I got that there for you guys. Okay. Thank you, sir. Oh, okay. I clicked on the wrong thing here. All right. Okay, here it is. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, 2, and 3. Now the Lord has said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, 
unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation. So let's say first here, he's talking, the subject is a nation. Not talking about salvation, talking about establishing a nation. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So uh, this is the purpose of the election when we see election in the in, in the in this context we understand that elected for what elected for salvation no elected to become a nation elected to have this messiah come from that genealogy so that all families of the earth will be blessed so uh God is sovereign and he chose these specific people for his purpose, but the purpose is not individual salvation, but rather is to establish a nation and to establish genealogy through the Messiah. Also, his choices were not based upon works. We're going back to verse 11. It's not based upon works. Uh, who's better, uh, uh, Isaac or Esau? Nothing to do with that. God just chose one for him, whatever reason he wanted to. He doesn't choose us for some random reason. You get saved, you don't get saved. You get saved, you don't get saved. It's not like pulling a ball out of a bingo thing where a ball pops up and the people get saved. That's Calvinism. This And that's how they twist this portion, this chapter, to make their case. Okay, Renee, what's your thoughts on that? Because the context, what this is talking about here, yeah, yeah. It, it refers back to this, this portion. Yeah. Of reason. And, and I, I didn't want to get ahead. Because me trying to just, you know, go over those verses would have meant I would have gone too far. What One thing I wanted to say here is God often and almost always uses whoever those of the flesh reject. Esau was the fleshly father's favorite. Remember, he was a hunter. He was a man's man. And he was his father's favorite, whereas Jacob was not. And what I see is God often chooses the lesser, like David. They didn't even consider bringing David in when they were choosing, when he was, uh, the prophet said, uh, God has chosen a king out of this family. Jesse brought all his big, strong sons and left David in the field, didn't even bring him because he was not, because God often looks for something uh, that is going to, people will know that it's God working. It's not of the flesh. It's not of man's will, but it's God working there. It's his plan. <clears throat> so uh, what I see here, and I'm so glad you mentioned it, is because I hate this any, mini miny, mo salvation lottery that, you know, they have come up with because it really gives God a bad name. And I've heard them use every excuse in the world to try to say it doesn't mess up God's character. If he saves anybody, he's still mercy. It's just, it doesn't sit well. So I'm so glad you're making it clear that it's nothing to do with salvation. And uh, when it says, um, which are the children of the flesh, it's not of the will of man, uh, but it was according to the election might stand not of works, but him that call it. So it's God's choice. And I believe he chose Jacob. He always chooses the one that seems to be lesser. And I wanted to mention something here. When he says, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Okay, the word hate here in the Hebrew, if you go back, it does not mean that, ooh, I just 